got it. All right. Yeah, and so let's move on. And so in this program, I think one of the key things is we're going to be learning by doing. So it's very important to, yes, of course, in, in class, we go over some of the knowledge, but it's very important to apply it and practice. And if you can code along, you don't have to, but that's, uh, you, you could do that, you know? So this is a weekly hour of code for 10 weeks and I'll alternate between building an app. So every alternate week I'll build an app and then the next week we'll dive into some of the key concepts. We'll be coding every week, but uh, there are five apps that we'll be covering, right? And when I'm coding, you're welcome to code along. So there can be a speed issue, right? Because you're seeing what I'm doing and trying to copy it. So we are recording these sessions and there's also checklists that I share on the Google Classroom and you can download that checklist uh, ahead of time and use that as a guide, which will, make, which will make it easy to follow along while I'm coding or also later when you are doing it on your own. But it's important to code, right? Unless we get hands-on, uh, the knowledge just stays like knowledge and it doesn't come to life. And to start with, you know, the apps that I show, I will also give you some ideas for extending them. And you can build similar apps. So for every each one of the five apps that I show you how to build, you can build your own with your own ideas, but you're also welcome to bring some bigger ideas you know, to the table. And as we go through this coursework, there's also office hours that I have on Friday at 4 p.m. Central time, also via Zoom. So during office hours or during other forums, we can see what we need to bring your ideas to life, okay? So we can at least make a start uh, right from the beginning. And I post material like this slide deck on Google Classroom. I believe the way to join the Google Classroom. I'm laughing because I haven't done this before, ex except as a teacher. So I don't know what life looks like as a student vis-a-vis Google Classroom. So I believe what you do is you go to classroom.google.com and then you enter this code and you'll be in. If uh, you have any challenges with that, you can email Nikki or I. Uh, all of you have her email, right? You're at least connected to Nikki, I think. So you can just email me and I'll add you to the class, all right? So this will be useful for announcements, discussions around assignments and sharing documents. And yes, there are assignments. What would life be without homework? So in terms of what you need, okay, so the requirements are kind of minimal. You do need a laptop and Windows or Mac, both are fine. And you gotta have a web browser. So this also works on Chromebooks, but I don't have personal experience with Chromebooks, all right? So if you have a Chromebook, that'll be kind of new to me, but Windows or Mac, I have tested this on both. You need a web browser, preferably Google Chrome, but I have done this with Mozilla as well as Opera, as well as Safari. So I think any browser will do. If you're using some very unusual browser, then let me know and let's see if we can figure it out, but just use Google Chrome, so that's a good idea. If using a company laptop, then you are responsible for being compliant with the company's security policies, right? And that they don't uh, prohibit you from, say, connecting to your phone from the laptop or even opening the App Inventor website. All the coding that we do will be inside the web browser. So there isn't much to install. There's one little component, we'll come to that later, but it is mostly in the browser. So your company policy should allow you to access that and also then uh, put your code on MIT servers and connect to your phone using your laptop. So sometimes company policies, if they prevent that, better to use a personal laptop or be compliant. You need an Android phone, but if you don't have one right away, and you know this works best with Android, it doesn't work as well with the iPhone because it is a technology that is meant for Android. So you do need an Android phone, but if you don't have one right away, then you can download and install what is called an emulator, which is available for both Windows and Mac. And the emulator is actually a way of testing the app that you build right on your machine, all right? So it avoids the need to have a phone right away, but of course, not everything works as well on the emulator. So if you build apps, when we build apps that use maps, for example, they don't run so good in an emulator. It's just a testing tool. So it's good to have an Android phone eventually at some point of time, maybe not in your first class right away, but in the third and fourth class, it will be good to have an Android phone and actually download your apps that we build and run them there. 
And yeah, when you have an Android phone and you write your apps uh, in the browser on the laptop, the laptop and the phone must be connected to the internet. So you do need an internet connection. Sometimes that's obvious, but sometimes it's not. So just making it clear. You need a Google account. So you will need it to access App Inventor. It's the only way to get in. So if you use Gmail, you have that already. And uh, yes, you will also need a Google account to join the Google Classroom. It's all free. Everything here is free. You know, the devices, of course, <laughs> are your own, but everything we do on the devices is free. And uh, you can create a Google site actually to host your portfolio. If you want to do that, let us talk, but uh, you don't have to do that. Okay, any questions in the chat box? Uh, Nikki, could you just uh, tap me on the shoulder if there are any burning questions? Yeah, we have a question. Oh, any suggestions okay. for an Android emulator for an iPhone? Android emulator. So, okay, maybe I, I, I should say this a little more clearly. The emulator is a piece of software that you will download on your laptop or uh, your Windows or Mac machine. So it will just, and we will, sh I will show you an emulator today. Yeah. So emulator is just a free piece of software. So you don't have to, uh, there's only one that MIT offers as a companion to MI, uh, the, uh, the app inventor. So there is no option. You have to go with that one. And uh, iPhone, I really recommend not, not doing this course with an iPhone. And I know that's a pain in the butt sometimes, but you know, this whole technology is around Android. And because the reason, reason for that is Android is open source, you know, uh, iPhone is not built with open source technologies, which makes it really hard and expensive to keep up with. And in the spirit of keeping this free, we go with open source technologies, which is Android. Android is an operating system, which is basically built on Linux, which itself is open source and free. Often it is free, yeah? So there are free versions available. So please uh, do this with an Android. If you really don't want to use, buy an Android phone, or if you don't want to go that route, just use the emulator, it's free, and it will suffice for whatever we do in this course. But if you want to do more sophisticated things like use maps, the example I gave earlier, use uh, artificial intelligence or uh, use social media and build apps that use AI, social media or uh, maps, you know, then, you're, then you really need the phone. Then you really need an Android phone, okay? Yeah, but for the 10, the 10 hours of code that we have, an emulator will be sufficient. I think you can use that time to make up your mind whether it's worth investing in an Android phone or not. Now, these apps do run in an iPhone. Let me be clear. If you use an iPhone and you find that it runs, you'll say, hey, uh, Sanjay was not correct about that. No, they do run, but they often are buggy and they will not run as you expect and they will throw up some unexpected behavior. So nowadays, the apps that we build in App Inventor, they also run on the iPhone, but it's far from perfect and it will just ruin the experience for you. So why not just get an Android phone? In terms of which Android phone, you can use a really cheap one. So I bought one from eBay for like $90. It runs Android 8, a very old version of Android. And these apps still run, you know, so you can buy a used Android phone to uh, reduce the expenses. All right, hope that answers the question. Yeah, and uh, what are we going to be covering? So when you look at, uh, coding, right? So some people say this is a non-coding way to build apps. I disagree. Actually, you learn everything that you need for programming. And so what is it that we need for programming? For, first of all, we need data structures, data structures. So what do we need data structures for? Because when we show a computer data, we have to represent it in a certain way. So that's what we need data structures for. And we will be using very state-of-the-art data structures in App Inventor. We need a way to tell the computer to make decisions and that is flow control. We, we use flow control in App Inventor. We need, to we need a way to package our code into procedures and we have procedures in other programming languages, procedures are called functions, for example, in Python or JavaScript, we have access to procedures. You know, then there's object oriented programming, there is uh, programming patterns, these uh, terms may not be very familiar to you if you're new to coding, but my point here is everything that you gain from a programming language like Python or JavaScript, a modern programming language, right? It is there in App Inventor. 
And so you're not missing out on anything just by using blocks instead of writing lines of code. So I just want you to know that. And in the apps that we build from uh, session one today to session 10, we'll be learning about uh, just how to integrate sensors with our apps. Smartphones have so many sensors, right? Can you think of what sensors they have? Type it in the chat box, if you will. But uh, there's at least a GPS sensor, a touch sensor. The screen itself is a touch screen. So that is a form of a sensor, right? There are so many other sensors. So App Inventor allows you to integrate whatever sensors are on your phone into your apps to create a rich user experience. And then many times what we want to do with an app is build animated games. And these games are built using what are called sprites. So these are the animated characters. They're called sprites. It's a technical term. They're called image sprites. And the background on which these sprites uh, are animated is called a canvas, right? So you have image sprites and canvas. You have clocks and timers, just like you have an alarm clock to wake up, to tell you to wake up. You can use clocks and timers to make uh, your animated characters do whatever it is you want them to do in your games. Uh, you have you can integrate some very powerful databases, right? Including databases in the cloud without getting too much into the details of using databases. Databases are complicated beasts, but App Inventor makes it easy for you to use a database and we'll be using one in our third app in our uh, week number five and six, uh, the app called Pong. You can use uh, uh, data structures as I was talking about. So in our app number four, we'll be using a type of data structure called a dictionary and a list, right? And these give you very powerful ways of representing data, which is the outside world to a computer, right? And then also when you write apps, how do you distribute them to others so others can download and use them? And how do you distribute the software? So one principle in the open source community is you distribute your code so others can start with it, improve it, and then distribute it again in a new and improved or a different version. So how do we do that? So we'll also learn about that in the last app that we will build in the series called the Turtle Graphics app. Yeah, and the kind of apps that people have built with this to just get a flavor. You know, this is a <laughs> very messy slide, but uh, a lot of people do home gardening nowadays, right? Do you do home gardening? Yeah, I see. Oh, accelerometer, gyroscope. Yeah, these are other sensors. Very good. Yeah. And yeah, Di Diana says she does, she does gardening. So yeah, there we go. So how do you monitor your home garden? And if you are an engineer like me, uh, I joke that I have a black thumb, not a green thumb. I kill all my plants because I forget to water them. You can build apps that allow you to monitor as well as uh, control your garden and operate devices like pumps. And uh, there are apps available already in App Inventor that do that. Actually, let me get out of the screen for just a second. And there's a, a wonderful community called YR. YR.media is their website. I downloaded this new uh, thing today. Oh, it does work. Okay, so I can zoom in. Yeah. So YR.media is their, uh, yeah, this is their website. And this is a community of youth and they have, adopted App Inventor to build a series of apps to solve problems for the community. So one of my favorites, and these are just young people, right? They have a radio, they have a radio channel. And one of my favorite apps that they have built is Map the Moment, which is a geospatial app that allows them to track school shootings. Oh, I meant, uh, let's not do this. Let's go back. That actually started downloading the app. Oh, please excuse me for a second while I get back here. Okay, so you can download the app. That was when I clicked on this, it actually started downloading the app. Yes, and uh, you can install it on your own Android device. And what it does is whenever there is a school shooting or whenever there is a policy event related to just uh, gun control, they mobilize themselves to influence policymakers. Now, whether that's a good thing or bad thing, uh, I don't know. But uh, they are certainly using this app in a very powerful way to come together as a community and influence lawmakers to make the right policies according to them, right? Uh, to make this less of an issue for our communities. And they have built so many apps. One of their latest apps is about the history of hip hop. And uh, it again is a geospatial map and you can go back and forth in time at any location like St. Louis, Missouri. 
And you can see the history of hip hop at that particular location. So you can have a look at this uh, another time, but uh, just to show you the power of App Inventor. All right, back to our slide deck. I know I'm talking a lot <coughs> today, but really, <coughs> excuse me. So my inspiration for this is uh, uh, Seymour, Seymour Papert. Uh, have you heard about Seymour Papert? He, a long time ago, uh, I, he's no longer alive, right? And uh, he started Media Lab at MIT. And his vision was to make technology really available to non-technical people so they could do powerful things with it. And that's really what's driving me, you know, to do this uh, course and other things like it. So that's the background and intro. And uh, we are on track more or less. So let's uh, talk about getting set up. So now on we'll be talking about what we need to actually uh, get coding, okay? Uh, you will need to join the Google Classroom. So use the instructions that I shared with you or send Nikki or me an email and we'll add you. But yeah, decks like this one are posted there. Uh, link to the MIT uh, uh, App Inventor website. So all your coding happens in a website, okay? Uh, let me just show you what that looks like. So it's actually AI2, now I need to get rid of this one, okay? It's actually ai2.appinventor.mit.edu. Don't bother trying to remember that. Although if you can, that's well and good. But all your coding, all our coding happens there. So there's nothing to download to get started. Yeah, so these are all the apps that I've built. And uh, yeah, today we'll be starting with a clean canvas. But it's basically all the action happens in a browser. All right, back to the slide deck. Get this Zoom thing out of the way, yeah. And so, yes, so the links to the website are in the deck. And I spoke about the emulator. So again, it's a piece of software. It's available for both Windows and Mac. You can download and install it from this link over here. And yeah, so the idea behind an emulator, emulator is not necessarily limited to App Inventor. Any technology that you use to build apps will have an emulator. So as you build your app, you can test it in real time, okay? And an emulator has certain limitations. So you'll see what those are. For what we're doing, we will, an emulator will be good enough to just test our apps as we keep building them, all right? Yeah, if you have any questions, I see I'm on my own laptop and logged into my Gmail. Same address that I sent. Yeah, yeah, so let me help you with this uh, in a little bit, okay? You do need to use the right... Uh... So you do, I think there is a HTTP colon backslash backslash and HTTPS colon backslash backslash. And I think you need to use the one. Let me just copy and paste from here. You need, you need, you need to use the HTTP one. Yeah. So nowadays, most most uh, websites are HTTPS. Oh, I see. You are asking for about the code for the Google Classroom. All right. So let me just get it out to you. Not for App Inventor itself. So that's the code. I typed it in the chat box. I think what you do is go to classroom.google.com and these are first day, so there might be a few hitches. So that's quite okay. And that may also be an HTTP. Oh, it is HTTPS, okay. So I think you should just go to that classroom.google.com link and type in that code and that should work. If it doesn't, don't panic, you know, uh, just send me an email or Nikki an email and uh, we'll make sure you're set up with that. All right, back to the slide deck. Back to where we were. So these are all the, what I'm going through right now is a laundry list of all the resources. Yeah, the, we saw about the emulator. Yeah, I have a blog, the link to that is posted here. So I keep blogging about different uh, digital technologies in the context of App Inventor and also outside of App Inventor. Okay. So I posted the link here just in case you're interested. And yes, for what we are doing today, 
you need to download a starter app. Let me put that, put the link to that also in the chat box. And we may have a bumpy ride today a little bit because it's the first day. So if some things don't work right away, don't panic, we will help you with that, all right? So if you can download the app, you don't have to do this today, but certainly from the next class, it would be good to download the starter app. So what is a starter app? So starter app is just a, a minimal bit of code I've written to get started, right? So when we build an app in the classroom, as we are going to do today, uh, you can code along with me and you don't have to waste any time. Let me close this window. I'm losing my way in all these windows that I'm opening. <laughs> yeah, so the starter app, right? So yeah, it's a, it's a file with a .aia extension. And uh, if you go to the App Inventor website and import it, and I'll show you how to do that, then it will have all the media that you need to code along with me and build the app. Don't have to do that today, but from the next time, it would be a good idea so we can build the app together. Okay, uh, I think, uh, any burning questions? No, I think we got most of the burning ones out of the way. Okay, we are about 30 minutes in. So now let me talk about App Inventor itself. So when you go to this website, ai2.appinventor.mit.edu, this is what you will see. And let me try and zoom into this, all right? Okay, let's make this a little bigger. Hopefully you can see this better, all right? Yeah, but there are two aspects to this. One is the designer. So you see, it gives you kind of a phone screen, right? And that is what that is what the app looks like in App Inventor, so on the website. So this is what you're seeing here. It's static. It won't do anything until we launch the emulator, okay? But uh, this is what we'll use when building the app. So it will actually start out with a blank screen. So if I, let me go to start a new project and let me just say dummy sdlwc remove code okay so let's get a feel for what all is on the screen so you see you'll start off with a blank screen right and if your phone size is different you can pick some other sizes here but stick to this one all right and there are really two screens one is called a designer and the other is called blocks we'll see what these are so everything here is drag and, drag and draw, right? And what you have on the left side of the screen are different drawers. So like right now the drawer I have open is called a user interface drawer. And there's a layout drawer and a media drawer and a maps drawer. And we'll see what each one of this is, right? And when we are building an app, the first thing we want to do is to craft the screen. What does a screen look like that we want to put in front of the user, right? So for that, for crafting the user experience, that is what the designer screen is for, okay? And in designer, we'll be using components from these drawers on the left. Let's look at these one by one. So there is the user interface drawer. The user interface drawer, think about this as like, what do you need when you build a form? You need things like buttons, what else? Labels, text labels, you might want to put in an image, right? special kind of text boxes for passwords, sliders, spinners, all kinds of things, right? Switches, check boxes. So when you construct a form, like if you have any experience with web development, web development is very much about putting forms in front of the user that they fill out and then submit, right? So all these elements you will find in the user interface drawer. And notice that as I drag elements from the drawer and drop them onto the screen, they appear there right away, right? But they are not looking very pretty right now. And the, the text is all, all very clumsy. So I'll draw your attention to the right side of the screen now. And as I drag and drop elements here, and now this is kind of getting busy, these elements appear in this components column on the right. And you see, there is a kind of a hierarchy here, right? So all of these, I just dragged and dropped them on the screen. So these are in a sense, children of the screen component. So we call each one of these a component in App Inventor. And basically you may have some hierarchy within them, but you can see them here. So this is how you know what are all the components that I'm using to build 
the user experience for my app, right? And then these components have properties, okay? So if, for example, I click on a button, the button has a background color. I may want to have the button look like a certain picture. So in that case, uh, I can go to image and decide what that picture is going to be. We'll be doing all of that a little later, yeah? I may want to change the button to, you know, super cool button, the change the text. It doesn't matter. We are just exploring, right? So now the text has changed to super cool button. So the key takeaway is that uh, you have these components on the left, you drag and drop them on the screen in the designer screen where you build a user experience. Once you drag and drop them on the screen, you'll see them in this components column, right? And then you'll see all the properties that they have that you can use to control or change their look and feel, all right? We'll be doing that in just a minute. So just hang on. Right now we are just exploring. So this is kind of the lay of the land. And other than form elements, what else is there? So as you saw, I dragged and dropped these buttons, these sliders onto the screen. They're all stacking up, right? And that's not so interesting. They're just stacking up one after the other on top of each other. If I want to do more interesting things with them, if I want to use up the real estate of the screen more effectively, then I can use these arrangements. So for example, if I pull in a horizontal arrangement, then let me put all the buttons in the horizontal arrangement, the super cool button. I'm again, just uh, dragging and dropping. Okay, so for some reason, it's not going to that. Oops, it's being a little more difficult than I expected. Okay, let's let's keep moving, yeah? So you have these arrangements like horizontal work, horizontal arrangement, vertical arrangement, when you actually want to group these things together and lay them out in more interesting ways to use up the real estate on the screen. There's always something that throws up a surprise. So right now, these, this is not cooperating, but we'll just keep moving on, right? Now your phone has a number of uh, devices that you can use for capturing as well as playing media, right? There's a camera to capture and show images. There's a player, there's an audio player to capture and uh, to record audio clips and also to play them. There is a, a video player. So you can also use this, these in your app. So for example, just to keep us moving, I dragged in a camera, I dragged in a audio player, I dragged in a video player. So now you see these don't appear on the screen, right? These actually, and my screen is blocked by Zoom. Yeah, here. Yeah. So these will actually appear below the, the phone that you see in front of you, but they do not appear on the screen because they are not they are not visual elements, right? So these are elements that you will use. Like if you take a picture with a camera, you will then set one of these image components to show that picture. That's why these media devices, any of the media devices on your phone that you want to use on your app, you can still use them just be aware that they won't appear on the screen like buttons and text and images, but they will appear below. For drawing and animation, you have uh, image sprites that I talked about. So when you build animated games, sprites are what uh, you animate. So talk, think about Flappy Bird, right? So you have a bird that flaps her wings and uh, you score points and there's some scheme wrapped around, uh, wrapped around that. So your Flappy Bird would be an, image sprite. And then of course you would write code to animate it. And the background would be a canvas. So that's what you find in drawing and animation drawer. You can use maps from the maps drawer. So if you want to build a GPS application, you would find everything you need here. Uh, any smartphone has a number of sensors. You uh, talked about the gyroscope and uh, uh, the accelerometer. There are so many other sensors. Now not every Android phone will have every sensor. But a typical smartphone will have at least an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a few more of these sensors, a GPS sensor, right? It's hard to imagine a phone without these. So you can use these as well in your app, like when you shake the phone and you want it to play an audio clip. And again, like the camera and player and other devices, it will just appear below the screen, all right? And then you have a lot of other drawers for accessing social media, for storage, on the cloud as well as on the local machine for uh, yeah social for uh, connectivity to bluetooth the internet etc 
there's a lot. So as we build these apps, we'll actually be using more and more, right? And so by the time we are done with the series, I think we will have used 80% of what's in these drawers. So if everything is not crystal clear right away, don't worry about it, just uh, hang in there. And then uh, blocks. So, so far in designer, we just create a static picture of what the app looks like, right? But it doesn't do anything until we go to blocks. And in blocks, you'll find everything that you need to write an app. You'll find, so I talked about data structures. So I talked about lists. I think even if we are not technical people, we understand what a list is, right? A laundry list. A list is often a great way to represent data to a computer. But when you have things like tables or tabular data in a spreadsheet, you might need a little more sophisticated data structure like a dictionary. So these data structures are available in uh, App Inventor. And if you have friends who are programmers, then like Python programmers, then they also use dictionaries and lists in Python very frequently, right? So yeah, so these are just uh, in almost every programming language, every modern programming language has this. Then we need to have a way. Oh, and by the way, uh, these are also drawers. And uh, when you see these blocks in the drawers, when we write code, we drag and drop them onto the canvas here, okay? And that's how we build a program, okay? I have to keep moving the Zoom things out of the way. Okay, let's leave things here and not waste time. Yeah. Then, so we are still exploring. We are not actually writing any code yet. We're just looking at what's in each one of these drawers and opening them and seeing what's in there and getting a feel for things, okay? When we want our program, our app to make decisions, then we open the control drawer. And there you see things like if then, right? Like if it rains, I'll carry an umbrella. So when we want to build this kind of logic into an app, then we use go to the control drawer. And there's more than just if then else. There's much more like for every item in this list, do this, right? So uh, this is what we use the control drawer for. Then there are procedures and we'll be using procedures uh, in the next app that we build, not the app that we build today, but procedures are a way of just encapsulating code to use in multiple places in our program. It's just a way of keeping code well organized and clean. It's also a way of sharing our code with others. You know, So if we, if we create a library that does fantastic algorithms and we want to share it with others to use in their own apps, then we can write procedures and then we can create distributables. So we'll be using procedures very early on as we start to write code. Usually as a programmer, I can tell you that when you start using procedures in your program, you basically reached uh, the next level of programming, right? Your skill has reached uh, a higher level than a beginner. So it's a good way to gauge for ourselves how, uh, how skillful we are. So procedures are there. Then as you see all the random buttons and uh, all the other garbage we dragged onto the screen in the designer. And by the way, this is a good time to just tell you that we can always flip between designer and blocks at any time, okay? So you can always just flip. And so, yes, whatever we dragged in these buttons, et cetera, they also appear here, right? So in the designer, I showed you that they appear in this column called components, but in blocks, they also appear here. So this is object-oriented programming. If you heard about object-oriented programming, there's more jargon for you to learn today, <laughs> but uh, object-oriented programming is just a fancy way of saving, uh, is just a fancy way of saying, we have objects like buttons, that not only have properties. So when we went to the designer for a button, we saw all the properties of a button, right? But you also have methods to change them. And these are called get set methods. As the name indicates, get is a method that you use to access the button's property, like background color. And set is what you use to change it in your code, right? That we'll write here on this canvas. So this is uh, gets us into object-oriented programming where it's not only data because all the attributes of a button, you could think about them as a kind of data and they belong with this object, right? The colors, the fonts, the images, the height and weight, the dimensions, what have you. All of these are data that belong to the object, but you also have the methods that you need to change the properties. And not only that, if you look at uh, something like a sound component, right? So this player is a sound player. 
think I'm going to need to launch this again. Doesn't matter. You're just playing around. Okay. I might have dragged too much of rubbish onto the screen here for. Oh, great. Now my mouse is behaving funny. Okay. There we go. Please, 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 please. Okay. <laughs> Oh, this thing is running away from me every time I try to click on the continue button. Hang on a second. Okay, there we go. We are back. So yeah, when I look at something like an audio player or an accelerometer, give me just a moment, okay? This has not happened before. Maybe we have too many things open. Close everything. Thank God that worked. Okay, so when I click on a player, for example, oh, there we go, we're back in business. Yeah, we have methods, for example, not only to change the properties of the player, like which audio clip it should play, which MP3 file, for example, but also to start it, to stop it, to vibrate the phone, to pause it, etc. Okay, okay. Let's uh, just pause for a moment. I've been talking a lot. So, any questions? It sounds like you guys are following along pretty good. General course, any of the weak power security as a topic? Yeah, no. But if you, you know, if you want, you know, what I do is in the alternate weeks where we cover specialized topics and do deep dives, I can cover security as a topic. Okay. Yeah, and uh, it, that's a good question though. I think even right off the bat, you can see that uh, the website itself is a HTTP, which means it's not a secure site. So you see a little warning here. And so, you know, that, that's where uh, with open source technologies, you often, you know, you're getting, you're getting good quality uh, components for free, but it may not necessarily go all the way, right? So. Uh, would I use App Inventor for building a game for my child? Yes, I would have no hesitation in doing that. Would I build use App Inventor to build an app for Bayer, my employer? Probably not, right? <laughs> so I would use something else to do that. But I could make a prototype with App Inventor and show it to my manager, supervisor, and say, hey, this looks cool. Would you like to try that? I can control our green light right from the phone. And they would get excited and they would say, well, Sanjay, how much money do you need? And isn't it better to go to them with something that works, but something that may not be 100% secure already, right? Yeah, so if you like, I'll cover security as a topic in one of the follow-up sessions, but yeah, uh, we can talk about that. Uh, I hadn't planned to cover it, okay? Good question though, keep them coming. I don't see another, any other questions. So actually, we'll start coding our app. And as always, you know, when working with uh, open source technologies, there can be surprises, right? So it's a very dedicated team of volunteers at MIT that keeps this thing going. And uh, yes, they are short of time. They are brilliant people. And they're very committed people, but they are also short of time and they have to prioritize. So things might not always work just as we expect, but we put a big smile on our face and we keep going, all right? So uh, what I will do today is I told you about the starter app, right? So I'll build a type of app called a soundboard app. And this app is very simple. So what happens here is uh, you have images on the screen and you tap on an image and it will play an audio clip. All right. So this particular app is called uh, I Have a Dream app because of Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And basically it's a very simple app. It has a picture of Dr. Martin Luther King and another one of Malcolm X. And I tend to prefer Malcolm X to Dr. King, but you can have your own preferences and prefer none of them if you so desire. But yeah, so when we click on a picture of Dr. King, it plays a speech by Dr. King. And when we click on uh, Malcolm X's picture, it plays his speech. And I said, I've created some of these AIA files. So we don't have to start from scratch and waste time searching for images of Dr. King and Malcolm X and audio clips, et cetera. 
So I'm just going to work off that same AIA file that I've asked you to download. I've already downloaded it on my app. And so I'm just going to take it from there. And it's basically, if you follow the link in the slide deck, it will take you to the same one. I have a dream starter.aia. Okay. And yeah, it's still a blank screen. So we are still starting from a blank screen. But if you see under components, there, there's no components, right? There's just a screen, which is always there. But under media, under that, you see all these JPEG files and MP3 files. And these are already, I've already searched and downloaded and uh, put them into this AIA file so you don't have to do it. Okay. And what we're gonna do is, uh, first we are going to build out the screen. So I'm in the designer uh, side of things. Are you okay if we go a little over time? Because this is our first session. So maybe 10, 15 minutes. It may take a little, we may go a little over today, okay? This is a lot to share, but yeah, I do want to complete this exercise today. And so what we're gonna do is first uh, drag an image, okay? So I mean, in the user interface drawer and drag and drop and put it on the screen. Now you see it has appeared here. I'm going to drag a text label, label, all right? And then I'm going to drag a couple of buttons. So these buttons are what will look like pictures, right? We'll come to that in a second. And then when we click on them, they'll play audio files. I'll grab another label. And then, uh, yeah, I think that is all that we are gonna need. Oh, and yes, I'm gonna to go to the layout drawer and grab a horizontal arrangement. So remember I said, by default, things just stack up and that's not interesting at all. So we'll grab a horizontal arrangement and hopefully this time, I don't have any issues with this, but it sounds like. I do not know why this is happening, but let me try doing something else. Let me make this bigger. Right now, automatic. Sorry, ran into a little hitch there. Okay. Let me see. I just made it bigger. Now I hope. Yeah, this is uh, somehow proving to be a little harder than it usually is for me, but all I'm doing is drying these buttons into this horizontal arrangement and it's giving me a little bit of a hard time doing it today. I do not know why that is. Ah, there we go. Okay, usually <laughs> it's, just, it's just the easiest thing in the world. Okay, but now finally we have the yeah, we have the two buttons side by side. So you see what happened by using a horizontal arrangement is I was able to make these buttons go side by side and I can do that. I have more interesting arrangements here, like a, a vertical arrangement, a horizontal scroll arrangement. If you have more elements than you can fit on the screen in front of you, then you can use a scroll arrangement both for horizontal and vertical. And we'll be using all these over time. So we won't go into the details. I got everything I needed, so that's good. And now so far things look terribly boring, right? So let's make this a little more interesting. So let's uh, set the properties of these uh, things that we dragged, these components that we dragged and dropped on the screen, all right? And let's start with the image. So I want this to be an image of Dr. King and uh, Malcolm X together. And again, I'm gonna to have to move zoom out of my way. Okay, so at the bottom of this screen, you see the media drawer. So here, the picture that has both of them together, I believe is uh, this one. You can also preview these by right clicking. Okay. All right, for some, I'm having issues today that I haven't had before. So usually when you click on these components in the media drawer, they it will let you preview it. But what I was going to do is I was just going to name this, uh, I was going to go to this image and you see it has a picture property, right? Oh, and it pulls up right here, so that's good. Then we don't need to preview, we can just experiment. So here's a picture that says MLK and Malcolm X. So I believe it's the one of those two leaders together. So I'm gonna set the picture property to this file, all right? And 
as I was saying earlier, I've already uploaded all of these. If you want to upload a if you want to upload a media element on your own, just click on the upload button and you can do it that way. Hmm? So, okay, let's get back on track. So I, I'm going to image, I'm going to picture, and I'm going to select this one of MLK and Malcolm X, and there we go. So now do you see how the image component is now showing what we wanted to show, all right? Let's do one more thing. Let's go to screen and let's look at a property called align horizontal. What does it say right now? It says left. So let's change that to center. And what's gonna happen is all that we have on the screen is gonna to move to the center, okay? So uh, yeah, so when we change this alignment property of the screen element, it actually applies to all the children of, of, that, uh, of that component, right? Not to that component itself. So likewise, if I go to the horizontal arrangement, now you see, now that the buttons are inside the horizontal arrangement, I can change the alignment to center and the, these buttons will be centered inside the horizontal arrangement. So that's how I can manage, how I use up the real estate on the screen in front of me. Let's go to label and let's just change this to, uh, yeah, let's just change it to MLK and Malcolm X. I'm going to speed it up a little bit. And now these buttons are what are going to look like pictures, right? So again, as you look at the properties of the button, so I've clicked on button, that's why it's highlighted here. Which attribute do I think, do you think I need to change to make it look like a picture? It's the image, right? And so the left one is going to be MLK and the right one is going to be Malcolm X, all right? So, yep, so there we go. So now these buttons have started to look like pictures, all right? And yes, if I wanted to play around with the size, then I would go back to the button and you see the height and width properties. I could play around with that. So it's automatic right now. But if I wanted to take up exactly half of the horizontal box, half of the screen, right? So since these buttons are inside a horizontal arrangement and the horizontal arrangement is taking up the entire width of the screen, so 50% here would be 50% of the screen. And likewise, I could go to width and make it 50% as well, okay? I, I could go to Malcolm X and make that 50% as well. Now you see there is some text that is uh, in our way on the buttons. I don't know if you can see that. That's just the text property of the button. So I'm gonna delete that since I have a picture. I don't need text on the picture. So I'm gonna do it for both of these images. And now I have uh, clean images, you know, that are basically buttons that look like pictures, all right? I'm gonna do one more thing, which is I'm gonna change the background color. So I'm going back to screen and changing the background color to black. And that means the text labels are not visible anymore. So I'll go to the text labels and change the background color to something like cyan. Yeah, okay, there we go. So we can play around with this all day, but uh, I, I think you're getting the idea, right? When oh, this text label, let's just call it, uh, let's just change the text to say, click on an image to play. Okay. All right, so far so good. So we are almost done with the designer. We have a question, Sanjay. Sure. Go ahead. The buttons are different sizes. How do I make them equal? Yes, uh, what you could do if you wanted to do that, what you could do is you could actually set the width by pixels in absolute terms rather than, uh, rather than percent terms, okay? Or you could do both with the same percentage value and then that would uh, also do it. So let me just do this. Let me make it, let me make the height fill parent and the parent of this is the horizontal arrangement, right? So both these buttons have the same parent called the horizontal arrangement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each button and set its height to fill parent. So that way they will have the same height. And then I'll set the width to 50%. So that's 50% of the horizontal arrangement. So now they have the same dimensions. Got it? Two buttons are different sizes. Yeah, how do I make them equal? Yeah. So now they have both the same dimensions. The height of each button is exactly the height of the horizontal arrangement, which is the parent and the width is 50% of that box, okay? So it's gonna stay that way. 
you can you can do more and that's uh, you know we can go over this in more detail at uh, in the office hours as well if your questions are not fully answered here but if you really want to go deeper then you could go into and set the pixel size itself and you could say like i want it to be 125 pixels i usually prefer to go with rel relative dimensioning because i don't know what is the size of the screen on the device that uh, a user may have but if you are confident about the screen size, then you can just specify absolute dimensions rather than relative ones in pixels, okay? Okay, I'll stick around after class also if you have questions. All right, and we need a few more things, right? We want to play audio. So we haven't worried about that yet. So I'm going to drag and drop an audio player. I'm also going to drag and drop a text-to-speech component. You see, these are starting to appear below the screen. And uh, what else do I need? I think uh, that is it for now. We need, oh, we need two players because we have two audio clips and so we'll drag a player number two. All right. And I think that, uh, I think we are good to go. So I'm also going to rename these because when I go into the code blocks, button one, button two, I'll forget which one is MLK, which one is Malcolm X. So I'll just call the button one MLK button, MLK underscore button. So what I'm doing is I'm clicking on that component, clicking on rename and just changing the name and call this uh, MX button for Malcolm X. And likewise, player one, I'll rename it to, so each player will play an audio clip, right? We can do it with just one player, but to keep things simple at the beginning, let's just have one audio player for one audio clip. And uh, this is MX, okay. So now we have also these components to start. And what are these audio clips I'm talking about? It's this king.mp3 and malcolmx.mp3 and they're already uploaded to this app. All right, I know it may not be the prettiest app in the world, but uh, look uh, how quickly we got off the ground, right? Uh, but still it doesn't do anything. So let's go into that next, uh, yeah. Oh, and before we do that, let's do one more thing, right? You know. I can set the properties of this, these players, these audio players in the code, or I can do it right here. So there's a source attribute for a player and I can set the source attribute of the MLK player to king.mp3, which is his famous, I have a dream speech. And the source of the MX, Malcolm X player to Malcolm X.mp3. So nothing happens yet, right? That only happens when we actually write code, but uh, we have now set each player, we have now defined for each player what uh, audio clip it should play. All right, all good so far? Got it, okay, all right, thanks. All right, let's go to blocks and write some code. And so the way apps work, any app, not just App Inventor, any iPhone app, any Android app, is a pattern called an event-driven pattern, okay? And as the name itself suggests, any action that happens is triggered by an event. And simpler events as we start getting into coding are like when the user of an app clicks on a button, okay? So here, now you see, I have all the standard components in the drawers like control, logic, math, dictionaries, colors, et cetera, et cetera. But all these components that I added to the screen are also appearing here. And here is where I can find the code blocks that I need to make these components do interesting actions, right? So let's start right away and take the MLK player. And you see this green boxes here? Again, I need to move some of the zoom stuff around. Uh, yeah, okay. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, not the player. Let's go to the MLK button, right? Sorry, we are clicking on the button to launch an audio file. So before we go to the audio, let's go to the button. So the button has all these, do you see all these green, bright green colored boxes? So these are called events, right? And every event has something like a, a user's action, like dot click is when the user clicks on the, on the button. So by click, we mean the finger, right? We'll be tapping it with the finger. Got focus, we means when you're hovering over it, long click, lost focus, you can work with a click or you can resolve the click further into when your finger touches the screen or the finger, finger lifts off the screen. So that is touch down and touch up. So we are just gonna use click. So I drag it and drop it to the screen, all right? So this is the event. What I'm telling App Inventor is when the user clicks on the MLK button, right? 
then do this and do what? Now that is called a callback. Okay, call back. So <coughs> all of event-driven programming is about this event and response. And you have an event handler, which has a green <coughs> box like this called an event <coughs> and then the callback. And what do we want to do in the callback? We just want to play the audio file. And since we have already configured the player and we've told it, which is the file that it needs to play, king.mp3, remember? All we need to do is click on the player. And what do you think we need to grab from here? A method, right? A start method. So start method will now tell it whatever source you have been configured to play. Remember we configured the source here. Just start that, okay? And now I'm going to launch the <coughs> emulator so we can test this little bit of code out. By the way, if you right click on the canvas, you can find some of these uh, things like uh, delete blocks or create an image out of these blocks or clean up blocks. So we'll use this later. All right, let's uh, go back to emulator. To launch the emulator, I've already downloaded it and installed it. So go to the connect menu and click on emulator. This will take about a minute to start. Okay, so we're just gonna have to give it a little bit of time. Yeah, unfortunately it takes a little time to start and until that time we cannot do anything. I see some questions in the chat box. So let me see, yeah. Will there be a recording of this class available to rewatch? Okay, yeah, there will be. And uh, yep, we'll be posting it in the Google Classroom. All right, so, so one of you had to leave. I'm sorry about that, but yeah. Okay, so this is the emulator. So you see, it's just a piece of software. I can drag it around and move it and it will allow me to test my app. Ah, there you go. So you see my app is actually playing in the emulator, right? And if I click on the MLK button, can you hear the, I have a dream speech? Let me turn up the volume. And my four little children. Yeah. Well, one day live in a nation where they will- Don't worry, we are not playing the whole speech. Oh, good. <laughs> so, yeah. So you see in just 10 minutes or 15 minutes, we have created a working app. How, how cool is that? But it's a very limited app, right? And so I'm just going to move away from the emulator. Uh, what else would we like to do? We would like to activate the Malcolm X button. So I right clicked on this event handler. You see duplicate, click on duplicate. Now it is showing me an error, right? Because I have two copies of the same thing which is uh, not acceptable. But you see a drop down box here with the green event handler, the bright green event handler. So this is what I'm calling the event handler, right? So yes, I can just click on that and it already knows, it's smart enough to know that there are just two buttons and this click event applies only to buttons. So Sanjay may want to pick another button instead of the MLK button. And so I can just do this right here and change both the button as well as the player yeah, to now play the Malcolm X recording. And we can test this in the emulator right now, right? So this image of them together, I click on that, nothing happens. Nothing's supposed to happen, it's just an image. I click on Dr. King's uh, speech, that will start to play. I could click on Malcolm X and Malcolm, Malcolm can you X. hear that? Uh, is that your legal name? As far as I'm concerned, it's my legal yeah. name. Okay. Would you mind so telling me in about 20 minutes, we have built an app, right? And this is this. My but there is a there is an issue with this, right? Which is that as it stands, it I have no way of stopping the audio clip when it is playing. Well, and uh, moreover, uh, if I click I both these buttons, do you see what's going on? It's very noisy. Both these kids are playing at the same time. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just going to turn on the volume down. So yes, we got something going and it's interesting, but uh, it has some imperfections, right? So the first thing we want to do is, uh, you know, we, we don't want to have both the, we, we don't have to, we don't want to have both of these playing at the same time. So we want only one playing at a time. And so how do we do that? Right, so for that we have something called the conditional logic. And uh, remember I talked about coding an app so that it can make decisions. So where do we go to do that? We go to the control drawer, right? And in the control drawer, drawer I have this if then 
statement that I'll pick. Let's start with this. This is uh, relatively simple. And what this does is it allows me to test a condition, okay? A condition means that it evaluates to only two values, true or false, okay? Like, is it raining or not? It can only evaluate to true or false. And here, what we want to test is, is, is an audio clip playing already, right? So if I want to launch uh, Martin Luther King's player, then I want to test if the um, Malcolm X clip is playing, right? So that is a condition that I'm going to test. And if it is playing, then what do I want to do? I want to stop it, right? Before I start playing the other clip, you get it? So I'm going to drag this if then statement into the even into the callback. And how do I test if a player is playing? So where, where would I look? I would probably go to look at the player, right? And which player? Well, I want to test if the Malcolm X player is already playing before I want to launch Martin Luther King's speech. So I go to the Malcolm X player. And is there anything here that uh, I might use to tell if it is playing? Yeah, so remember we talked about the get and set methods, which I can use to query the properties of a component. And happily, there is an is playing component for us already, right? And I can take this component and I can plug it into the test right away. So if Malcolm X player is playing, it's almost like English, right? We are writing code by just creating sentences in plain English. And if the Malcolm X player is playing, then what do I want to do? I want to stop the Malcolm X player. And so then I go to one of these methods and which one am I going to use? I'm going to use the stop one. Okay. And I can test this out right away, right? And I can, this is for the MLK button. So I will launch Malcolm X's speech and turn it up real loud. Okay. And, launch it. and now when I click on MLK button, it should stop Malcolm X's speech and play just the MLK. You see that? Right. So, My four little yep. children. so now only one place for MLK, right? It gets very noisy. Yeah. So I only wrote this code for the MLK button. So let's do the same for the Malcolm X button. And we are, we'll be wrapping up soon. Okay. So don't uh, worry. Maybe in another five minutes. Yeah. So this if then statement. And mind you, this if then statement. It need not have just one branch. It can have any number of branches, right? And you can test any number of conditions. And the way to do that is click on this little blue, little blue wheel, and then you can drag this else and you can just keep adding more and more branches to this. And the way this goes is if, else if, else if, else if, right? So if not this, then if this, if not that, then this, if not that, then this. So you can actually create a, a ladder, right? To test a variety of different conditions and tell your app what it should do when any of these conditions is met, okay? So you're learning some pretty powerful concepts in programming, right? Even on just day one. And so here, what are we gonna do now? So let's just finish this, right? Uh, this is the Malcolm X button. So we wanna see if the MLK player is playing. So that's going to be our test condition. And if it is playing, then we want to stop it. And so now this is done, all right. And let's do one little, let's do one little tweak to this. You see what happened, what's happening now. And turn up the volume again. I have a dream. What is your real name? Okay. I have a dream. Malcolm X clip is, is very soft. So Malcolm X, yeah, uh, is that your legal name? I have a dream. Okay. What now do you see name? how this is working? Malcolm? Yeah. Now there's one problem though, which is that, uh, I don't know if you noticed it, but when we click on a button, it starts playing the clip from the beginning. And let's change that behavior to pause the clip and pick up from where we left off. And the way to do that is actually simple. Instead of the stop method. So when we use the stop method, the next time we start that clip, it will start all over from the beginning. You see, there's also a pause method, right? So we can just replace the stop method with the pause method and we'll get rid of the stop. And so there's a little dustbin over here that gets hidden by zoom. Okay, I'm just gonna right click and delete. Uh, oh, there we go. 
the spin's not opening. Come on, open, open. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, drag the other one. You can also right click on it and uh, just say delete. Computer is being a little funky today. Open, open, open. Oh man, okay. It seems to have a mind of its own today, so it's okay. I'm just gonna delete it with a delete key, all right? So all I did was replace the stop with the pause, okay? So Malcolm X goes to MLK, MLK goes to Malcolm X. And now we can test that out as well. I won't test that because it's, I know it's gonna work. Uh, all the code will be shared with you. So you can do, you can try these things out yourself. One last thing I'm gonna do is, uh, you know, I'm going to drag an accelerometer sensor here and we'll finish up right after this one. Accelerometer, I will find it in the sensors drawer. Let's grab the accelerometer sensor, drag and drop it here. So now the accelerometer sensor has appeared here. And let's go back to coding. What we'll do is we can make it so when we shake the phone, it will play one of those clips, right? And for starters, we won't care which clip it plays. Now the accelerometer sensor has appeared here. I'm going to click on that. Now you see it has an acceleration changed event that I can use to detect any kind of change in acceleration, right? In X, Y, Z coordinates. But it conveniently also has a shaking method, a shaking event, right? And I can use that. So when the phone is shaken, because we encounter this uh, use case of activating some action when we shake the phone so often that they have given us this block for shaking instead of leaving it to us to, us to figure that out from some math uh, based on the acceleration changed component, delete that acceleration change component. So when the phone shakes now, let's just, uh, play Dr. King's speech, right? So I'm just gonna duplicate whatever is in the callback for Dr. King's speech. I right click on that block and duplicate it and I move it here. Now, unfortunately, I cannot demo this because I cannot shake the phone in the emulator. So that's one of the limitations of the emulator. But now what this app is going to do is anytime you click on these images or shake the phone, it's going to play the speech, okay? after checking to see that uh, there isn't something playing already. And if it is, then we pause it. I've been talking a lot. <laughs> uh, I get so excited and I get carried away. But uh, that's kind of what I had planned for today. This being our very first, uh, our very first uh, engagement. Let me check in the chat box. Okay, cool, thank, thank you. And so what we'll be doing next, is uh, yes, we'll be building an app every alternate week, but next week we'll be diving deeper into some of these concepts because we kind of went over them at a very fast clip today, right? So what is event-driven programming? What is an event? What is a callback? Uh, and how, we will be going through a series of how-tos, like uh, how do we make a button change color when we click on it? How do we make an audio clip play? How do we use a variable to store information in the app? or when to use a variable. Uh, so we'll be going over some of those as a deep dive the next uh, Tuesday that we meet. And the week after that, we'll get on our second app. So this is all I had for today. Do join the Google Classroom uh, and we'll take it up from there. Will you send the links to the AIA or anything we need before the class so we can? Yes, I will have it posted in the Google Classroom before the class. So you'll have plenty of time to download it and be ready, okay? So do get on the Google Classroom so we can manage our communications in a little more organized way. And that's all I have for today. Any other questions, any thoughts, any, anything you wanna share? I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see you. Did you see the comment, add Leah to yes. the Google Classroom? Okay. Yeah. Carol.com. Let me just copy and paste that. First of all, let me stop sharing so you guys can see me. Okay, there we go.